Hi there, my name's Andy Young and I'm one of the automotive lecturers down at Unitech in Auckland, New Zealand and welcome to my Andy Mechanic YouTube channel. Now, at the moment I'm teaching fuel injection and ECUs and ignition systems, that kind of stuff uh, at the moment at college and one of the reasons why I'm throwing these videos together to be honest and one of those videos needs to be uh, idle speed control valves. Now there are many many different versions of idle speed control valves and this video only covers one type uh, because uh, I've got all the RAV4 bits that I pulled apart earlier in the year and they're just a hand so I thought well what the hell you know Toyota's are pretty pretty common this particular type of idle speed control valve which is the rotary type um, is extremely common they use it an awful lot so um, and it's one of the ones that we use at Unitech for our teachings so what the hell let's do a video on it and then uh, makes life a lot easier for everybody, doesn't it? So you'll find this is the throttle body off the RAV4, but hey, you know, throttle bodies are all pretty much the same, very similar units, and you'll recognize this thing here, this is the TPS, there's plenty of videos that I've done on TPS units here, look, and that one is, that's the four pin TPS, there you go, look, with an idle switch inside. Okay, but at the other end of the same, so you've got the spindle here, look, there you go, so you've got the TPS on this side, and uh, you've got the throttle spindle and dangling underneath we've got this idle speed control valve. Now what is an idle speed control valve? Why does it exist? Well let me tell you why it exists. We've got in here the, uh, the butterfly valve so when, when we press the throttle down this opens and allows air into the engine and that's essentially how we control the RPM of the engine. So the more we open the throttle the more air goes into the engine and of course the more the engine revs up. Quite simple. Okay, so what about an idle speed control valve? Well, when the engine's at idle and our foot is off the throttle pedal, then essentially this throttle valve is pretty much closed. So all the air to the engine has to get in there somehow because hey, the engine is still running, isn't it? So let me just find a little pointy stick for you. Screwdriver. Okay, so if you look just inside there, you'll see there's a little, a little sort of inlet where air can get down there and it goes into the idle speed control unit here, look. Now, just for reference, there's a part number for you, because Toyota use these on lots of different ones of their cars. Uh, oh, upside down, sorry guys. Okay, there you go. So it's a 22270-74. 240. So all the specs that I give you for this RAV4, if you've got a car with the same idle speed controller on it as the RAV4, then all these specs will tally. You'll be able to use these specs for your car as well, even if it's not a RAV4, provided it's got the same part number. Okay, so to remove this unit from your throttle body, you've got four screws to undo. There's one here, one here, and then there's two more. So we'll get those cracked off. I'll get this unit split off the intake manifold and we can go from there. Right, let's crack on with this. So we'll get those cracked up. Oh, that's not a very good fitting screw down, is it? Nope. Let's just try that one. There we are, that's better. Oh man, they're tight. Never been undone, I think, I wouldn't say. Okay, again. Jeez. Wouldn't have thought I ripped a muscle out of my arm the other week, would you? Right. One more. Cool. Okay. Get those ripped off. Now there were no known faults with this vehicle as regards its idle, it seemed to run pretty well when it was cold. Okay. Oh nice, oh lovely, look at that. See there you go look, there's, there's a problem, see all that gunge in there? That shouldn't be in there. Wow, that's horrific. Okay, well this is going to need a bit of a clean isn't it? Right, we'll get rid of that for now. That's going to want to clean too. Jeez. It all seems to work okay, but 
could do without that in there, couldn't it? Okay. Well, that's what you need to do. Make sure there's no dirt in there. There is. Clean it all out. Okay. Looks like I've got some cleaning to do. Right. Now, whilst we're looking here... Sorry, Tang. Right. We've got these two, which are coolant pipes. And there's a reason for that. So we've got engine coolant flowing through this chamber here. And that's also... You know, that, that chamber down there looks all that's together, like that. So we've got coolant flowing around this area here. And inside here, we've got um, a bimetallic spring. And that reacts to coolant temperature. So when the coolant's cold, it holds this, this valve here in the open position, or very close to open, so we get what we call a fast idle. But, as the coolant warms up, the effect that, that spring has on the rotation of the shaft is, is reduced, and it reduces more and more as the engine warms up. Basically, its torque effect on this shaft changes and reduces. Now, on this end of the shaft, because we've got the shaft running through the middle there, look, because it's a rotary valve, on this end of the shaft, we've got a couple of coils. Now, those coils are controlled by the ECU, and these are the, this is where the connector plug goes. And those two coils, the, the common terminal is the center one, and that will be 12 volts supply, battery positive supply, going in there. Because don't forget, ECUs, they always switch the earths. So... This will be one of the coils, and it would have a switch inside the ECU to ground it, to energise the coil and let current flow through that particular coil. And then vice versa for this coil. If it wanted this, the other coil to energise, it would ground this side. OK, piece to camera, I think, here. Um, much easier. We've got the idle speed control valve, and as you can see, it's got that bimetallic um, spring on this end, and it's got the ECU input on this end. So on this end of the shaft, We've got uh, engine temperature directly and mechanically affects the movement of that shaft. And on this end, we've got an ECU. The ECU has the ability to rotate the shaft either way. So the ECU has the power to increase engine RPM at certain points. Now that could be, for example, um, when you park in the car and you know, the, uh, the power steering pump puts a load on the engine. And, of course, the ECU has to bring the engine revs back up again to compensate for that extra load and to ensure the sufficient pressure to provide us with power steering, or a good power steering effect. Uh, the same would go if you turn on the air conditioning. Turn on the air con, the compressor puts load on the engine, and, of course, the ECU will know all that, and it will bring up the engine RPM as a result. And to do that, all it needs to do to increase engine RPM is to open that valve slightly and allow more air into the engine, and that will bring up the, uh, the revs slightly. Okay, so we're going to go right through all the test procedures for this and I think the easiest thing to do first of all is to look at the bimetallic spring and how that operates. Now the ECU isn't aware of that bimetallic spring, it doesn't even know it exists. Uh, it's a mechanical function and it reacts to coolant temperature. So when the coolant is cold, the bimetallic spring, because we want fast idle when the engine's cold, so the engine warms up quickly and it's not all lumpy and horrible to drive, um, the bimetallic spring will open that valve slightly. And I, it's really hard to see, I know, because it's all gummed up and dirty, but there's a little valve in there. I'll see if I can clean it off for you can see it a bit better. Um, yeah, I've got a bit of brake clean left over, so I'll give that a go. So the bimetallic spring makes sure that that valve or basically puts a torque on that, on that, uh, that rotary valve to give us more air during idle so we get fast idle. But as the engine warms up, that torque effect reduces and the ECU's input through these two coils sort of takes over. That becomes dominant. So during cold start, the, uh, the bimetallic spring is the dominant factor here and that controls the positioning of that um, rotary valve, the air valve. But as the engine warms up, then the control passes mechanically to the ECU and then the ECU has a digital control, an electronic control over the positioning of that valve.
by using two magnetic fields to move that that shaft around and we'll get to, to that in a bit more detail a bit later on but first of all let's open up this bimetallic spring and see what's inside just so you get an idea of how it works we're also going to test the operation of that bimetallic spring using a heat gun uh, one of those hot air heat guns now the first thing you must do before you take these things apart and you can see there's a bit of a paint pen on there somebody's already marked it that's probably in the factory this is adjustable you can undo these two bolts and you can rotate that plate and that will adjust what fast idle is when the engine's cold. So if it's idling a bit low, you can adjust that plate. But normally, once the fact set in the factory, you shouldn't really need to adjust them. So what you should do is get a little scriber and just scribe a line between that plate and the casing. That also means that you put the spring back in in the correct orientation because you could be 180 degrees out. So it's very important you mark it. Oh, there we go, one scriber, so I can do that. Let's just mark it down this side here, look. There we go, you can see that or not, but I've put a little mark, there you go, on the side there. So I'll be relating to that later on when I reassemble it. Okay, so we're going to need a small screwdriver. Right, one star... One small star screwdriver. Let's even get those two undone. That's one, two. Excellent. Okay. Now these things are normally sealed up. Because let's face it, you don't normally go in these. I'm just doing this to show you what's inside so you've got an idea. Right. Little flat screwdriver. Let's just give that a little pry open. Oh, there we go. Right. So, we've got... Cool. That's what's inside there, look. Just like a, a plastic carrier. And then you've got the bimetallic spring just there. Now, there are different versions of these. And you can see there, look. This sort of this coiled up spring. And what we'll do is we'll mark the position, well the, the output, what rotates that that plastic. You can see the little notch down the bottom, look. Well that's that's where the notch of that spring, the little tail of that spring clips into so that when the spring rotates and uncoils or coils up, whichever it does, we'll find out in a second it takes with it that plastic collar and that plastic collar is attached to the shaft, the rotary shaft which is the valve, essentially. So we'll mark very carefully we'll get a paint pen and we'll just mark on that casing the position of that little tail We'll set the camera up so you're looking overhead, we'll warm it up and we'll see how it moves. Here we go. Okay, so we've got the uh, little biometallic strip and it's sort of adjusting plate just lined up on the vise and you can see quite clearly that the strip here, this sort of little tang that clips into that plastic sleeve, I've put a little black mark on there and they're pretty much lined up. In fact, from where I am, they're definitely lined up. Okay, I'm going to warm that bimetallic strip up now. You're probably going to get a bit of really adverse wind noise here, but there's not a lot I can do about that. pretty impressive it reacted really really quickly to changes in temperature and you'll see that as I'm talking now this is going to be cooling down and you'll see that the little tine is going to go back to its original position we had a full 90 degrees of movement uh, when it was at uh, maximum temperature now this is position it would be in when the engines warm and as the engine cools down you would see that this will eventually it'll end up back around to this point here uh, and it's in this point here for cold start purposes. And who knows, you know, on a, on a really cold day, it's probably even going to be further round, you know, because it's about 23, 24 degrees today at the moment. So on, a, on a, a cold, frosty morning, it's going to be a bit further round. And the further round it goes, the more it opens that air valve. Maybe if I give it a blow, it might cool it down. Yeah. 
There you go. Okay, so that's how the biometallic strip works, and that's how it has an influence on that rotary air valve that's part of the idle speed control valve. Okay, so you can see now, look, it's almost back to its original start point. Uh, and that's been cooling for a couple of minutes while I've been setting up for the next step. Okay, so we're going to leave that out. And the reason why I'm going to leave that out is I want you to, to see how the ECU has control of the, uh, the shaft, the valve, um, you know, once the engine's warm. Because that's what it's all about. Once this has turned that 490 degrees to, to you know, over to this side, wherever it was, um, it has much less torque effect on that valve. Uh, and essentially the valve closes. Not all the way, but most of the way, so the engine revs come down. But every now and again, the ECU is going to want to bring those revs up, and I'll show you how it does that. So the next step is um, I'm really I'm going to remove this so you can see what's inside because I, I you know that's as mechanics that's how we learn we like to dig our way in see what's going on. Normally you wouldn't have to remove this, but I'm going to take it off just so you can see what's going on. And again, there's two posi screws to two posi screw uh, machine screws to remove. So I'll do that now. Okay. Cool, yeah. Okay, that's one. Poor little round fours, but we're never going to go back together again, is it, at this rate? Keep taking bits apart more and more. Right, so remove the screws. Again, there's some sealing agent on there, so we've got to break it free. There we are, look. Okay. Nice. Okay, well, I've got some sealing agent. Oh, actually, this one's in pretty good nick. In fact, it's really good, Nick. If you look inside there, you can see the two magnets, the two poles. One there, look, and one there. And inside this unit, there are two windings. I'm going to measure the resistance of those windings very shortly, and I'll tell you how they work in more detail. But on the end of this shaft, and this is, of course, oh, don't want to lose that back in there look okay that was down there like uh, like that there we go perfect right leave that in there okay on the end of the shaft what we've got is a magnet look at that okay now that's not the screwdriver okay um because you can see it clips up here as well if it's a screwdriver it's just usually the tip but that's actually a magnet that's on the end of that uh, that shaft and you can see now as we turn that this opens and closes so that will be the valve you know fully open maximum revs at idle ma maximum fast idle fully closed engine is probably going to stall to be honest it's not going to get hardly any air at all so it has to you know regulate as to where that wants to be now the the position of this shaft is controlled during cold start by the metallic spring but as the engine warms up the ECU the magnetic fields produced by this coil have more and more effect on the position of this shaft okay so you know you can see it's got a magnet on the end so that's gonna basically react to the fields that are produced by this so let's now look at what's really going on inside here well we know that there's two windings and we know that the common pin the middle pin is, the, is one end of each of those two windings and the other end of each of those two windings one is one winding ends here and the other winding end ends here uh, so we can take a resistance reading for those two windings let's do that first okay so we've got our meter set on ohms and we'll measure first of all what they call the RSC terminal to the 12 volt supply so 12 volts is going to come in here these two are grounded by the ECU. Okay, so we'll just put a do these two first. And there's no internal meter resistance, I've already checked that. So we've got 21.5 ohms. Okay, let's see what the other side's got. Should be about the same. Twenty-one point six. Okay, and that one there, going back to the first one again, was twenty-one point five, wasn't it? Perfect. Okay, so they're both 
get the, basically got the same reading. Now we can actually check the operation of the the valve. Now it's moving quite freely now, so I can test that as it is. Let me try and give it a bit of a clean for you. You can see it, see, you can see it working better. Okay, there we go. Look, Andy's done some work for you. All right, so it's it's moving pretty freely now. There is still a bit of carbon build up in there. I can feel it's a little bit notchy, but I need to free that off because it's got to move. They should move absolutely freely. And you can see the valve there. That's the valve in the closed position, and that's the valve now open. And that's basically its full movement. Okay, so we're going to reattach the unit. Now, obviously, I'll do this at a later date with some sealants and stuff on there because it needs to be well sealed. So that can go back on there again. Look, we chuck the two screws back in. Oh, plastic bits stay in there, please. Thank you. Right, stick that in there. That's screw number one. Screw number two. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply a voltage to those two windings, one at a time, and you'll see the uh, you'll see the actual valve mechanism move one direction, it'll maybe open, and then as we apply the voltage to the other winding, it'll then close. Then we'll talk about it a bit more, because it's not quite the whole story. Okay, now when that's bolted back on again, if you have taken it off, do make sure that you've got uh, movement on that, on that valve, very important. Okay, so we're all set up, and you'll be able to see the um, little valve down there. Look, it's currently, you know, about half, about half open there, and that springy effect there—that's produced purely by the the magnet reacting against these coils. Even when they're de-energized, there's a bit of magnetism going on. Okay, because there's no spring, there's nothing in this end at the moment. I've taken all that bimetallic spring out. Okay, so we've got 12 volt feed. I'm going to connect the circuit now onto the power supply and we should see some kind of movement on the uh, on the valve. There you go, look. Look at that. Cool. So that's terminals RSC, which is the, the left-hand one, and the middle terminal, 12 volt battery positive, opens that valve up. Okay, so all we need to do now is move the earth to the RSO terminal, that's the top one in this orientation, and do the same test, and we should see it close. There you go, look. So it's energized, it closes, de-energized, it opens a little bit. There you go. Cool. So if I, yeah, there is a bit of a spring thing here going on, so. Oh, it's quite strong, look at that. Fantastic. It works. Great job. Okay, let's talk a bit more about how it really works. Okay, well things are looking up for the little round four at the moment. I found a few more components today that actually do still work, which is great news. Now, those terminals here, okay, I've got my little diagram, so I want to make sure I get this right for you. First of all, small screwdriver, sorry, right, very disorganized. The middle terminal here, that's battery positive, 12 volts going in there and it's these two outer terminals here that the ECU grounds. Now the official names of those, we've got the one that's next to the little tag at the top here, that is the RSC terminal, okay? And this one here is the RS open. So RSC, close, RSO, open, maybe. There could be a bit of logic going on there, couldn't there? Okay, and Basically, the ECU, it doesn't just turn one of the windings on when it wants to open the valve and turn the other one on when it wants to close the valve. No, no, no. It's not quite as simple as that. Because the ECU needs sort of real-time control. It needs to be able to adjust that valve very, very accurately. Uh, and also to sort of keep hold of the shaft from a, a magnetic um, perspective. So it actually supplies those two windings a duty cycle. Now that means that over a given period of time, one of the windings may be energized 50%, 60%, whilst the other one is maybe only energized 10%. And then when it wants to move the shaft, it reduces the duty cycle on one of the coils, but at the same time increases the duty cycle um, on the other coil. So you get this, this change in duty cycle between these two coils. 
and both coils are, uh, are producing a magnetic field and that magnetic field is reacting with the shaft. It's sort of, because there's two fields there, it's sort of keeping hold of that shaft and it's able to, to maintain its position very, very accurately. That's how it works. Now, if you're doing an on-car test, and I, I have tested these Toyota ones on-car, from memory I got a frequency of that duty cycle of about 127 hertz. So it's doing that 127 times a second. So if you've got a second period of time and you chopped it up into 127 equally sized segments, then each segment, that little tiny piece of time, would be a single actuation. Uh, and then that, the percentage of that would be the duty cycle. So if it would be 10% or 15% or 60% of that tiny segment. And you can measure duty cycle on your meter as well. Some good meters have got a duty cycle setting and they'll also have a frequency setting. So you can actually measure both of those on the car. The Toyota workshop manual that I've got, the genuine Toyota one, didn't give me a frequency. Because I suppose it either works or it doesn't. The frequency is not going to change unless, of course, the ECU is faulty. But it probably just won't work at all. Um, as regards the duty cycle, yes, we can measure that. Does it give me a reading anywhere? I couldn't find it. It probably is somewhere in the manual, but on the bits that I've read, I couldn't find it. And the manual that I managed to download was tremendously fragmented. Basically, every page was a separate file, and I had to sort of drag everything in, go through the whole thing to try and reassemble it. Um, so that's how an idle speed control valve, a rotary uh, air valve type idle speed control valve works. It has two inputs. It has a mechanical input to do with the bimetal spring at one end and that that's basically reacts to coolant temperature. Uh, and the ECU doesn't even know that that exists. It's a completely separate independent mechanical system. And then on the other end, on this end here, things get a little bit more complicated where we've got a couple of coils and those coils are fed uh, 12 volts in a duty cycle, just like an injector is, they're fed at a duty cycle, and that basically allows the ECU to have control to raise and lower RPM. And of course, the ECU knows what engine RPM is, and if it's below what it needs to be, then it'll pick it up, and if it's above what it needs to be, then it'll bring it down. Really quite as simple as that. Okay, well that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you found it really helpful. Um, these idle speed control valves can be a little bit on the technical side, and it's certainly one of the, uh, the more confusing components for my students. So I'm hoping this video is going to really help them to understand what's going on and how to test them. Now, you've been watching the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel. If you'd like to subscribe, why not click on the subscribe button and you'll see a little gear icon appear. If you click on that, you'll be able to turn on notifications and that way you'll get an email sent to you as and when I upload any new videos. And there's usually two or three, sometimes more, every single week. I have been a little bit slow in the last couple of weeks because I've been really, really busy on teaching. We just, just started the new fuels course. Um, you'll also find me on Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and Twitter. And please feel free to uh, communicate through any of those portals to me. However, I would ask, please use YouTube as your sort of default. Uh, if it can go on YouTube, sticky question on YouTube, because the answer that I give may help other people as well. Whereas if we use Facebook or Google+, then those questions are either private or they get lost. People don't know that they're there, you know? So it's, it's a lot easier just to keep everything, if we can, on YouTube. Okay, uh, well, that's probably about it. Okay, crew, well, thanks for watching. Cheers for now. Over and out.